Welcome to the Metropolitan Council Transportation Committee meeting for March 25th, 2024. Uh, our first order of business tonight is approval of the agenda. Um, I would note that we uh, may have to adapt a little bit for employee recognition because the people are not here yet. And so we might shuffle that later into our agenda. And uh, uh, if there's no changes or additions beyond that, we can what? All right, seeing none, our next order of business is approval of the March 11, 2024 minutes. Did anyone have changes or additions? Seeing and hearing none, I entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Moved by Council Member Carter, second by Council Member Vento. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay, and the motion carries. So we'll start first with reports and I'll turn it to MTS uh, Director Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Council Members. Uh, update on the 2050 Transportation Policy Plan. We are underway with agency stakeholder review of chapters of the, the next Long Range Transportation Plan, the 2050 TPP. Uh, this is a major step in a process that actually started in 2022 uh, and has involved local government and agency stakeholders throughout the region. Uh, primarily through the TPP advisory work group uh, that some of you serve on, as well as the TPP technical work group uh, comprised of uh, staff from agencies and, and local governments around the region. Uh, so select chapters of the TPP uh, draft have been distributed to council members uh, for your individual review. Uh, these are, those chapters are the ones dealing with the goals uh, for the plan as well as uh, policies and actions in the plan. So uh, those were emailed last week. As a reminder, send your comments directly to Jed Hansen. Uh, and as another reminder, do not send your comments to other council members uh, or to TAB members, and please refrain from any discussion of them outside of um, public notice meetings where it's on the agenda. Um, so just a reminder on that piece. Uh, what will happen then is staff will compile individual comments that we receive. Uh, those would be presented and reported on at a future meeting with council members uh, and with TAB members for their comments. Uh, we're targeting perhaps in May for when we would bring uh, a review uh, or, or that summarization forward. Uh, so investment plans for each mode have also been distributed to the TPP advisory work group for review uh, seeking their comments by April 12th. Uh, so th this round of stakeholder in input will guide revisions and comment response in the plan uh, for the public review that will begin in August uh, following uh, committee uh, and subcommittee processes that actually begin in June. So a busy couple months coming up uh, responding to draft comments, but then really gearing up toward the large public review uh, set to begin this summer. Uh, as a separate update, uh, last week the TAB's TAC Funding and Programming Committee adopted final technical scores for the 2024 regional solicitation. Uh, so this sets the, the scores for TAB to consider. On most categories, a separate committee of TAB members scored unique projects uh, and is wrapping up its work. So compiled scores will be presented to the TAB next month, and then funding scenarios will be discussed and developed later this summer. Uh, ultimately towards selection of roughly $250 million of projects around the region. With that, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to stand for any questions. And thank you, Charles. Any questions or comments from council members? <coughs> All right, seeing and hearing none, we'll turn it over to Metro Transit General Manager Kinderis. Chair Barber, council members, uh, well, first, thank you uh, for waiting on employee recognition. And I'll just note our uh, awardee is here, so we can go back to that item. But maybe I'll do my report first, and then uh, we can return to that item on the agenda, if that works for the chair. But uh, chair, council members, uh, first off, I wanted to thank those of you who participated last week in a Trans Employee Appreciation Day and our Great Day in Transit events. I know employees really appreciated seeing council members out there and I hope you enjoyed your time as well. And in that vein of recognizing employees, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the work that's been going on the last several days because of weather. Uh, Metro Transit has had relatively few opportunities this winter season to implement our agency's winter weather emergency plan. Uh, but the storms that arrived in the region last Thursday and again yesterday really have given our, our teams a chance to show how well they do in the face of weather challenges. Uh, ahead of the first 
first storm, the public facilities maintenance team ensured that LRT stations were pre-treated with a beet juice mixture that helps to prevent snow from sticking to platforms while being environmentally friendly. After the snow fell overnight, operators and maintenance teams jumped into action and ensured that we delivered service, including 88% on-time performance across the bus system. By midday, the snow melted and our team started working on preparing for round two. Uh, snowfall predictions, as I'm sure you've noticed, have varied widely, uh, but everyone was focused on, make, on you know, knowing that we were in store for a wet, sloppy storm yesterday. Uh, snow started falling yesterday morning and at times was falling at a rate of more than one inch per hour. Our light rail and bus service were largely unaffected, each maintaining full service all day and into <coughs> the evening. In fact, bus on time performance for the day was more than 80%, which is a strong showing in sometimes challenging conditions where slow and steady are really the recipe for success. By the end of the storm, a daily snowfall record of 8.2 inches was measured at Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport, but we had just one collision involving a bus and two collisions in which cars struck light rail tra trains. Uh, so just wanted to give a special thanks to our bus and train operators, control center and field supervisory staff, facility and vehicle maintenance teams, and the many other employees who prepared and supported the operation during these late winter snow days. Um, once again, demonstrating that Metro Transit can be counted on to get people where they need to go every day. So uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions and when the time's right, we can go back to employee recognition. Perfect, thank you. Questions or comments? Just kudos, like yeah. we, we do know how hard <laughs> it is to respond with some of the, the storms coming in and all of this, and we know it's an all out effort with a lot of people, so we appreciate it. Um, and I will turn it to you now for employee recognition. All right, uh, well, Chair Barber, council members, as I mentioned, uh, last week we celebrated <coughs> Transit Employee Appreciation Day, um, but we often have employees who go above and beyond to keep our system moving and our riders safe, and this today is an opportunity to spotlight one of those individuals, um, his situational awareness, quick action, and commitment to the safety of others prevented a potentially serious incident on the blue line when he noticed an individual riding the coupler of a train. So to introduce this employee and share a bit more about this, I would ask the chair to recognize Jim Perrin, an assistant manager in rail transportation, to say a bit more. Welcome. My name is Jim Barron. I'm a, an assistant manager with rail transportation. And this is Ilmi, Hassan Ilmi, and he is the train operator we are recognizing today. On Monday, January 29th, while operating on the blue line, Mr. Ilmi identified a situation where an individual was riding on the coupler of a train. He promptly reported the incident to rail control showcasing exceptional awareness of his surroundings and a commitment to ensure, ensuring the safety of others. Thanks to his vigilance, the individual was successfully removed before any harm occurred. We extend our gratitude to Mr. Ilmi for consistently maintaining a watchful eye on his surroundings and commend him for his outstanding performance in fulfilling his responsibilities as a train operator, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. I'll meet you right over here for your report. Okay, wonderful. thank you. <laughs> I, I can't imagine for my what a scary situation. January Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad they were able to make it. What a story, I can't imagine. Um, uh, uh, now we'll turn back to our agenda and move to our TAB uh, report, and Mr. Dugan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Vice Chair, Honorable Committee Members, Director Carlson, General Manager Kenderis, and Jenna, who takes care of everything. I can't forget you, Jenna. Uh, right, I'm gonna keep this brief because you have a long non-consent uh, uh, agenda today. From TAB last week, uh, Right before the TAB uh, meeting, the consultants from HDR who were doing the listening sessions held one for the TAB citizen members, modal representatives, transit, uh, bike ped, uh, and freight. 
those who are not elected officials. And it was well attended, uh, good feedback on helping to change and improve the re regional solicitation process. There have been seven listening, listening sessions so far, there'll be 30 in total, and a summary will be released, uh, I believe in May, uh, some, sometime in May for all of you. A uh, uh, couple of themes that just very lightly came, not lightly came out, but just to give you an idea from the TAB folks were, you know, uh, adherence, uh, close adherence to the TPP goals, uh, simplifying the uh, application process, and considering what the maximum and minimum award should be. Uh, and as Executive Director Carlson said, the regional solicitation projects have been scored and appealed, and they'll be released to TAB in April for review only. Uh, they are, they'll be coming out with a ranking, but no budget uh, numbers, as I understand. And, uh, Okay. And then the active transportation work group that is meeting uh, for the uh, special uh, sales tax money that is coming, uh, they considered uh, uh, three, uh, there's basically three options that they're looking at. One is to add select projects to the 2024 regional solicitation. Obviously, since that's very soon, it would need to be done just a couple select projects. Uh, and I'll certainly defer to Chair Barber or Executive Director Carlson for uh, other comments on that. The next option that is being considered is, would there be a 2025 separate solicitation uh, similar to the regional solicitation? So you'd have the, perhaps the regional solicitation on even years and this, this uh, act of transportation on the odd years. And then, of course, the final option is, would it, would it be incorporated into the regular regional solicitation in the first year of that would be 2026. And also, I had uh, the pleasure of uh, doing one of the surveys with our uh, consultants for the regional solicitation and uh, regional solicitation and what you want to do with transportation. I met with the consultants and it was really great to meet the public and get some of their comments and learned a lot and yeah, it was, I personally, I always like to meet face to face with people and hear what they have to say. But thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. DeGan. Questions or comments? Just a note of appreciation, Peter. Thank you for uh, participating in the survey effort. Uh, this was an effort to, to combine, um, you know, there was an online survey, but then there were intercept surveys at different points around mm -hmm. the region and uh, that was a way we could get um, more specific feedback, uh, more representative feedback, and uh, direct engagement with members of the public, and very appreciative for uh, your joining our, our teams uh, doing that work. Um, and being such an introvert that I am, I uh, intercepted many people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we ended up, if I may say, at the group that we were with, uh, doubling the number of surveys that previously we've been done. Mm -hmm. we, get, we had 30 in person versus about 15 or 16. And it was great, they, were, they did a great job. Thank you, Mr. Carlson, Madam Chair. Thank you, any questions or comments? Um, I would just uh, follow up to um, uh, Peter that these regional solicitation listening sessions, there are 30 of them, they're happening all over. Um, as chair, I've been invited to all of them, so I've been listening to some of the other ones. It's been very, I participate in my local ones and all that, but listening to others, and just the wide range of opinions, and it's gonna be an interesting challenge for MTS and crew to compile all of that into something, but it's, but it's really um, a great way to kind of connect and learn the priorities of your communities. So if you get an opportunity, I um, encourage you to attend those. Um, and anything? Thank you, all right, um, then we can move on to, thank you, Peter, on to our first um, agenda thing, which is consent agenda. Um, I'd entertain a motion to approve the items on consent. So moved. Moved by Council Member Vento. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Tyrone Carter. Uh, is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay, and the items on consent are adopted. Now we're on to our non-consent business. There are three items for the Metro E-Line that are first on the agenda, and we're going to have a presentation with those, and their business item 2024-68, same week, 2024-69 um, and 2024-70. And we have um, Adam Smith and Evan Owens Ambrosia here to present. Welcome. Thank you. 
Uh, Chair Barber, council members, uh, my name is Adam Smith. I'm a manager of BRT projects uh, with Metro Transit. So today I will be presenting an update on the Metro E-Line arterial bus rapid transit project uh, in advance of those three related business items. Um, so just starting with a little bit of an overview or refresher on the E-Line. Um, it's about a 13 mile corridor uh, running mainly along University Avenue, 4th Street, Hennepin Avenue, and France Avenue. The E-Line will make 34 stops between the Metro Green Line Westgate Station in St. Paul and Southdale Transit Center in Edina. The E-Line will substantially replace uh, Route 6, which is currently our sixth highest ridership local bus route within the region. Um, and construction on the E-Line is set to begin this spring um, and uh, towards an opening for service in late 2025. So the three uh, business items being brought today uh, are really um, representative of a critical stage, a critical step in advancing the E-Line for construction. They include authorizing a construction contract uh, as well as contract options for pylons and shelters. Um, so E-Line construction will include stations and other supporting infrastructure, notably uh, an operator restroom facility at the northern end of the corridor. Um, and at 12 intersections along the corridor, uh, the project will construct improvements that are funded by a number of our local agency partners. And those include um, improvements to pedestrian safety, accessibility, and bicycle infrastructure. Um, I'll also note that substantial construction associated with 25 E-Line platforms has or will uh, occur through projects led by uh, agency partners um, on the E-Line. So agency partnerships is a big, big theme with the E-Line um, as it is with many of our projects. Um, the next three slides really kind of highlight some of the uh, typical construction activities that folks can expect to see uh, over the next two construction seasons. Um, one of the, the main ones, of course, being uh, construction of the BRT platforms themselves installation of vertical amenities, such as shelters and pylons, reconstruction of pedestrian ramps, improvements to um, roadway pavement, um, pavement markings, and then modifications to traffic signals, as well as installation of a fiber optic communications network along the corridor. Uh, finally, I just wanted to provide kind of a, a high level overview of some of our planned and ongoing uh, outreach efforts uh, for the E-Line. These include a pre-construction postcard that'll be sent out to addresses along the corridor, uh, weekly E-Line newsletter emails and website updates, uh, a construction phone hotline, uh, door knocking, and then again, coordination of uh, those communications with uh, those partner agency-led projects. <coughs> and so that, that's what I have for this part of the presentation. Happy to take any questions before we get into the business items. Thank you, Adam. Questions or comments? All right, seeing none, back to you for the business items. All right, go ahead. Um, all right, thank you. Um, Madam Chair and committee members, my name is Evan Owens Ambrosio, and I'm a principal engineer in the RTL BRT department. So I'm here to talk about the award for the Metro E Line construction contract. Um, as you just heard, the Metro E Line involves construction of 53 bus rapid transit platforms along a 13.3 mile corridor, uh, mainly following France <laughs> Avenue, Hennepin Avenue, 4th Street, and University Avenue from the Southdale Transit Center in Edina through Minneapolis um, to the Metro Green Line Westgate station in St. Paul. Um, the project will also construct and operate a restroom, fiber communications, and locally requested pedestrian, bike, bicycle, and signal improvements at several intersections developed in coordination with Hennepin County and the city of Minneapolis. In the fall of 2023, Metro Transit initiated supplemental contractor outreach, which included hosting an information session and sending a survey out to potential bidders to help inform our procurement schedule. The invitation for, for bids for this project was advertised on January 9th, 2024, and a pre-bid meeting was hosted by council staff on January 23rd that outlined the solicitation requirements, discussed the project specifications, and responded to plan holder inquiries. Overall, there was significant contractor interest in the project with 49 plan holders, including eight prime bidders, 
27 subcontractors, and 14 suppliers. 14 of the plan holders also identified as women, minority, small, veteran, or disadvantaged business enterprises. Council staff facilitated a, pu facilitated a public bid opening on February 27th, 2024, and four bids were received. The four bids that were received ranged from $39,416,070 to $41,377,480. Morcon Construction Company Incorporated submitted the low, responsive, and responsible bid and is recommended for award. The Office of Equity and Equal Opportunity assigned a disadvantaged business enterprise goal of 20% for this solicitation, which is equivalent to about $7.9 million. OEEO determined that the firm being recommended for award has met the DBE requirement of this contract. Funding for the contract is available and authorized in Project 61004 for Metro Transit participation in the amount of $30,764,889 and the remainder of the contract value will be funded by cooperative construction agreements for locally requested scope with Hennepin County and the city of Minneapolis following execution. A same week council action is requested to ensure timely contract award and construction start. There are two full seasons of construction planned for the E-Line with construction scheduled to start in May, 2024. Revenue service on the Metro E-Line is expected to begin in December, 2025. So in conclusion, business item 2024-68 requ requests that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to award and execute contract 23P210 with Morcon Construction Company Incorporated for construction of the Metro E-Line arterial BRT project in an amount not to exceed $39,416,070. Thank you. Thank you. Questions or comments? Uh, Councilmember Carter? I haven't written Route 6. I'm embarrassed. So I'll have to get out on Route 6 and look forward to the upcoming E-Line. Thank you for the report. Um, I do note that Westgate, of course, is in St. Paul, and you're traveling immediately, of course, to 4th Street, Hennepin, and all through Minneapolis and Hennepin. It notes that the partnership for this line is with Hennepin, Ramsey, and St. Paul are not involved. And could you just explain to me um, how that works when there is a station impacted? Sure. Uh, thank you, Chair, Council Member. So in this case, uh, we, we are actually um, entering into a joint powers agreement with the city of St. Paul, um, but no funding is involved in that. So mm -hmm. essentially, the, the uh, agreements that we highlighted are those where either this construction package will construct uh, local improvements funded by local agencies mm -hmm. or where we are funding um, amenities that will be used for the E-Line as part of um, already programmed projects through our partners. Um, as you mentioned, yeah, the scope kind of in terms of how much uh, E-Line construction will take place within the city of St. Paul is pretty limited, so the nature of our agreement is really more focused on um, access to publicly controlled right-of-way by the city. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yep. Okay, additional questions or comments? Uh, Council Member Chambliss. Um, just a brief comment that, um, you know, going through the process of review and development of the plans and now being at the point of awarding construction is pretty exciting. It's 2024 and it'll be done in 2025, so um, it, it gets real now, and uh, it's going to be a great benefit. I drive through that corridor in the, um, the section where I live in the, in the northwest corner, um, and I see a lot of foot traffic. People cross in very, uh, the busy roads, I, more so than I see in other places, so I think this is going to be a, a mm -hmm. great benefit. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments? All right. Seeing and hearing none, I entertain a motion to approve business item number 2024-68, same week. So moved. moved by Councilmember Tony Carter. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilmember Chambliss. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And the motion carries. And back to you. All right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, council members, business item 2024-69 seeks authorization to exercise an option on an existing contract with Albrecht Sign Company for the fabrication and delivery of pylon signs for the E-Line in an amount not to exceed $2,100,000.
Pylons are a signature feature of BRT station, stations that provide real-time information and contribute to the recognizable branding of BRT stations across our region. This option would make use of the council's existing pylon contract to obtain 65 pylons primarily for the E-Line. This quantity also includes five spare pylons and two pylons to be used for a future permanent D-Line station. This contract was competitively procured and executed in 2021. The contract was structured with an initial base order plus options to purchase more pylons within the five-year contract period. As a result, this purchase will allow us to take advantage of previously negotiated unit pricing. Um, the Office of e Equity and Equal Opportunity thoroughly reviewed the original procurement for this contract, and based on their research, no DBE goal was set. However, pylon installation will occur through the E-Line construction contract, which, as you heard, um, has a 20% DBE goal assigned to it. Um, I'll also note that this will be the last arterial BRT project that will use an option under this contract, um, and we've done some early coordination with OEEO as we prepare to re-procure uh, this contract for future lines. In conclusion, business item 2024-69 requests that the council authorize the regional administrator to exercise an option on existing contract 19P385A with ASC Acquisition Company doing business as Albrecht Sign Company for the fabrication and delivery of pylon signs for installation on the E-Line project in an amount not to exceed $2,100,000. And with that, I'm happy to stand for questions. Thank you. Questions or comments? Councilmember Vento. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Adam. I, th this is a question that's not limited to the E-Line, but in the work that's being done in, in all of the arterial and, and LRT and BRT work, um, are, are we consulting with uh, folks who are visually impaired or have other um, disabilities that we should be addressing to make sure that their needs are met. My reason for asking this is that I recently heard, and I believe it was on national public radio, but it might have been local, um, a, a story of an individual who was really struggling with transit. I'm pretty sure it was national. Um, but the frustration was just not being able to read um, read the signs, given the distance and the size of the print. So I'm just wondering, how much consultation do we have and what kind of work can we do to make the experience more beneficial for all folks? Yeah, appreciate the question. Chair, council member, so, um, you know, I think there are a few things that we do. Uh, certainly, we uh, work with other internal staff within Transit Information, other departments within Metro Transit who are really tracking some of those best practices when it comes to um, providing information um, uh, for customers, you know, who have limited um, seeing or, you know, other, other disabilities. Um, I'll also note, too, that in the past we have um, brought uh, some aspects of planning to the uh, the TAAC mm -hmm. in terms of getting some feedback around uh, what is going into plans, and so um, you know certainly something that is a an ongoing conversation. And as we look to um, you know make design changes and and um, go from project to project, something that is a is something that we'll, we'll want to continue to be uh, engaged in. Good, thank you. If I could just, I, I, would, um, I would encourage us in all of our work to, to really, really zero in on this. We have a, um, a significant growth in our elder population as our researchers have shared with us more than once. And with that is gonna come additional challenges. And one of the things that folks as they age wanna do is to hang on to as much independence as possible. And that's especially true when it comes to transit. So I think whatever we can do to help help keep that, that independence for them as long as possible is, is a good investment. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Additional questions or comments? Councilmember um, Carter. Um, no, oh, thank you. I'm sorry. I'm just getting the hang of understanding what pylon signs are. And, you know, they're they're extremely useful, of course, and also pretty expensive. So I was just digging into what they are. Thank you. No problem. Um, if there's no additional questions, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2024-69. So moved. Moved by Councilmember Tony Carter. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilmember Vento. Is there any other discussion? 
Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those nay, motion carries. Back to you, Adam. All right, uh, so thank you, Chair Barber. Uh, council members now have 2024-70, the E-Line Station Shelter Contract Option. So this item seeks authorization to exercise an option on an existing contract with DuoGuard Industries Incorporated for the fabrication and delivery of BRT shelters in an amount not to exceed $2,060,000. Uh, arterial BRT stations feature signature shelters that help provide a high quality customer experience with lighting, heating, and protection from the elements. Shelters are equipped with security cameras and emergency telephones, contributing to a safe waiting environment for customers. This option is for delivery of 67 shelters, pr primarily for installation on the E-Line. Uh, this quantity includes nine spare shelters and two shelters to be used for a future permanent D-Line station. Um, I'll note here that we anticipate um, any of the E-Line stations where civil construction will be completed within this 2024 construction season uh, will have shelters installed by the end of the construction season so that they can be open and available for customers use next winter. Um, again, this contract was competitively procured and executed in 2021. The contract, again, was structured with an initial base order plus options to purchase more shelters within that five-year window. Um, OEO set a DBE goal of 9% on the original shelter contract and has found that the awarded vendor um, continues to meet the requirements of this contract. Similar to the pylon contract, the E-Line will be the last arterial BRT project uh, that will use an option under this shelter contract. And in conclusion, business item 2024-70 requests that the council authorize the regional administrator to exercise an option on existing contract 19P385B with DuoGuard Industries Incorporated for the fabrication and delivery of bus rapid transit shelters for installation on the E-Line project in an amount not to exceed $2,060,000. With that, yeah. happy to take questions. Thank you. Questions or comments from council members? Council Member Carter. Yeah, I was just interested in uh, what characteristically are these shelters uh, and what improvements do they have over previous shelters that we've employed? Sure. Chair, uh, Council Member, uh, great question. So um, one of the, the things that these shelters have is um, they all have heating and lighting. Um, in some cases, they are replacing stops that don't have any shelters today. Um, in some cases, there are shelters there. Um, these shelters often, um, they have um, foundations, so they're a bit more substantial. Um, they, they have uh, emergency telephones at them, so kind of, again, that, that sort of security element to it as well. So um, just kind of a, a, a more substantial presence and uh, more coverage when it comes to protection from the elements. Okay, additional questions or comments? All right, um, I just have a couple now. Um, I just wanna say this is fantastic news. Um, um, I was here when the A-Line opened in 2016 and to see us now embarking on the fifth of our ABRT lines um, is really, really profound and really shows why we are a national leader in this space. And if you look at where our ridership has been growing and, and really held on, it's really been through the ABRT system. Um, I think that you know we just have to be really proud of what we've been doing here. And I would say it's uh, we're thankful for a lot of great leadership started by Charles, followed up by Ms. Katie Roth, who is in the audience, um, and people like you, Adam, with, who are spearheading these projects. Um, it's just really, really, to me, quite impressive of, of what we've been doing and how we're looking at building our network and building something that's really with an eye to the future. Um, uh, recently, on a great day of transit, I spent my day out in the D-Line, and I, when you have that opportunity, I would recommend that, I mean, a lot of us will go out in the LRTs and think, go ride one of our ABRT lines. It was actually amazing how busy it was all day end to end. Um, you know, those numbers are, are numbers that we see on the page, but when you go out and ride in it, you're actually seeing the real real-time impact of what we're having on the riders um, who use the system. So um, with that, thank you for indulging me, and um, I will now entertain a motion to approve business item 2024-70. Motion to approve. Moved by Council Member Chambliss. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Council Member Tyrone Carter. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And I the motion carries. Somewhere. 
Oh, sorry. My phone wants to talk to, or my watch <laughs> wants to talk to you. All those in favor say aye. 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 And the motion carries. Thank you. All right, now we are on to business item 2024-75, which is a Haywood's office systems upgrade. And we have Molly Ellis here to present. Welcome. Good evening, um, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm here today to talk about the Haywood office systems upgrade construction project. Um, this image shows the renovated employee lobby with keeping the bike parking inside and some hotel spaces off the lobby. The planned renovation is for building interiors and systems that are past useful life, the replacement of the building electrical and mechanical systems throughout, and will also include interior upgrades for equity and accessibility in toilets and workspaces. The scope will refinish all five floors with standard finishes, replace major building components for electrical, mechanical, plumbing, data, and security. The purpose and need of this project is to improve accessibility throughout by remodeling the entries, toilet facilities, and other amenities. To improve employee experience and retention by desk ergonomics, uh, better lighting, and wayfinding throughout the facility for employees and visitors. To make the building easier to maintain with durable materials compatible with cleaning equipment and functional HVAC um, and energy efficiency standards. The proposed action is to award and execute the contract 24P005 with Versicon Incorporated for construction services in the amount of $14,171,360. The DBE goal for this project was 15% and the DBE contract commitment was 15.5% for Versicon. The timeline for this project is a phased move out happening now, um, March through May 2024. The building clean out will happen shortly after this May with construction start happening uh, early June and then construction completion happening through um, October 2025. Any questions on the presentation before I move to the business item? Very good, thank you. Questions or comments, Council Member Vento. Um, thank you and, and thank you very much, Molly. Um, given the age of the building, the 1984 age of it. I'm wondering if there are any um, um, portions of what um, of the 14 million that will be needed for asbestos removal or other kinds of, of uh, materials that could pose a risk to those who work in these areas as well as the people doing the work. We did set aside some funding in the overall budget for unforeseen conditions mm -hmm. during construction, knowing in an existing building. And um, we did a preliminary report for um, an inspection that determined that there was minimal risk, and we identified some minimal areas that the contractor is aware of. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Additional questions or comments? All right. Seeing and hearing none, I entertain a motion to approve business item 2024-75. Motion so, to approve. Second. Uh, moved by Councilmember Chambliss, second by Councilmember Vento. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay, and the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we are on to business item 2024-76. It's a alerts manager and real-time concentrator systems, and we've got um, Ben Rakuski here to present the next few items, and this will be the first one. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair and Council Members. I'm Ben Rakuski. I'm the Senior Manager of Transit Information at Metro Transit. I'll be presenting business item 2024-76 uh, uh, for our alerts manager and real-time concentrator systems. Our proposed action is that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to execute an amendment for contract 19P218 with Arcadis Architects uh, to continue providing and supporting our transit alerts manager and real-time concentrator systems for a cumulative not to exceed contract amount of $1,223,402 and to extend the term of the contract through or to July 31st of 2026. And for a little background on the alerts manager and real-time concentrator systems, these are software uh, systems that um, our teams in our transit control center and transit information use to uh, update our customers and keep them posted about alerts and then the real-time information about our vehicles. 
Um, as I mentioned, our staff use the vendor system to create rider alerts and also provide trip data in a standard format and then make that avail information available to our customers uh, about real-time transit service and changes or disruptions. Uh, I know uh, uh, General Manager Kenderis mentioned we did really well in the snowstorm uh, yesterday, but that would be events where we're letting our customers know if we're uh, rail delays or if there's detours or snow reroutes, um, bus stop closures, et cetera. And then these are pushed out throughout our customer information tools, our real-time signs, uh, trip planner, um, our website, next trip system, et cetera. And then of course our third-party apps like Google and Transit App. We established a three-year contract with Arcadis back in 2020. Uh, and then these systems are part of what we consider kind of critical components to our customer information technology ecosystem. Uh, we are working right now uh, on an effort to uh, put together a package procurement with multiple customer information systems. Uh, and the alerts manager and real-time concentrator systems will be a part of that competitive procurement. But the RFP and subsequent contracts will not be in place until after the expiration of the contract for these systems. Um, so the original amount authorized for this contract was $800,000. Uh, effective from April 30th, 2020 to July 31st, 2023. Contract Amendment 1 extended the term through July uh, 31st of 2024. This contract amendment request is uh, to extend that term two additional years to July 31st, 2026, and for an additional $423,402. And with that, I'll stand for questions. Thank you, Ben. Uh, questions or comments from council members? Seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2024-76. So moved. Moved by Councilmember Tony Carter. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilmember Tyrone Carter. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Back to you, Ben. Uh, the second business item I have for you today is business item 2024-77 for our real-time prediction engine uh, system. Our proposed action is that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to execute an amendment for contract 18P322C with Cambridge Systematics uh, to continue providing and supporting a real-time bus prediction uh, engine system for a cumulative not to exceed contract amount of 1322000 for some background on this system, the prediction engine is software that generates um, accurate bus departure predictions uh, that our customers depend on, and we make those available through our customer information tools. Uh, again, our website, our next trip system, our automated phone system, and available through our third-party apps like Google, Apple, uh, Maps, and Transit app. We established a four-year contract with Cambridge Systematics in 2020, and this was after um, a pilot period where we uh, had vendors compete against each other uh, to provide the most accurate and complete predictions. Uh, we awarded the contract to Cambridge Systematics, and they've continued to improve the real-time predictions in our system over the last four years. Uh, this, uh, in addition, is uh, one of the critical information systems in our technology ecosystem, and it will be part of that competitive procurement that I just spoke of, uh, where we're bundling multiple systems in a competitive procurement. Uh, but similarly to the other systems, the RFP and subsequent contract will not be in place until the expiration of, of this contract. Uh, and we believe this is an essential system for continuing the operations of our real-time information. The original amount authorized for the contract was $972,000, effective April 3rd, 2020 to April 2nd, 2024. This contract amendment request is for an additional $350,000, an extension of that term for two years through April 2nd of 2026. And with that, I'll stand for questions. Thank you. Questions or comments from council members? Council member Chambliss. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I know these are, um... This business item and the prior business item are different contractors, but um, both of them have uh, interfaces with uh, some of our apps. Um, is, is there an interface between when the bus is leaving, leaving um, to the other system um, so that customers can know when to expect their bus arrival and departure? Uh, Chair Barber, uh, Council Member Chambliss, that's a great question. Yeah, so th these are all interrelated systems. So the real-time prediction engine, um, what its primary uh, job is to take our vehicle position and trip update speed and then apply 
logic to give you the most accurate prediction of when we think the bus will leave your stop. That then actually flows through our real-time concentrator that was talked about in the previous uh, amendment, and um, it's merged with our alert speed. So you get the information about the vehicle location, as well as any alert information, and then that's pushed out to our uh, tools, our website, third-party apps as well. So you can get that whole spectrum of not only where your bus is, but if there's any alerts or disruptions that are, are um, causing it not to serve that stop you're at or something like that. Cool, thanks. All right, additional questions or comments? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2024-77. Motion to approve. Moved by Council Member Chambliss, is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Ventel. Is there <coughs> any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Close nay, and motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our uh, final two business items for the night are both associated with the Blue Line State of Good Repair Phase 3. And we have uh, Michael Winnick here to present for business item 2024-78 uh, and 79. And Brian Funk, welcome. <laughs> Hi, uh, Madam Chair and Council Members, Brian Funk, uh, Chief Operating Officer. Uh, before Michael gets started, uh, I just wanted to say uh, just two things. One is that uh, at our meeting on April 8th, so the next scheduled meeting, uh, we'll be providing a, an update for you about our uh, rail construction plans for 2024. Uh, we have a number of shutdowns uh, that will be uh, replacing trains with buses so we can get some really important work done this year. And so we'll provide an overview of that information as well as a little bit of forecasting for 2025 and 2026. Uh, Michael today is going to be uh, bringing forward a couple of business items because these are really important long lead time items. But I uh, just wanted to make sure you understood that uh, all this information is being provided and uh, Michael's going to do a, a great job uh, to get us started down this path. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. I'm turning to you. All right, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, hello, I'm Michael Winnick. I'm principal, pro principal project coordinator, rail projects, and the project manager for the Blue Line State of Good Repair Phase Three project. I'll be presenting business item 2024-78, uh, Blue Line State of Good Repair Phase Three, uh, Alstom signaling sole source. Um, and in the interest of fewer words, I'm just going to call the project Phase Three from here on out. All right. So, Blue Line State of Good Repair project is a state of good repair project focusing on replacement of track, interlocking, signaling, and communications equipment on the Metro Blue Line between Cedar Riverside and Terminal 2 stations. Uh, revised track layouts as well as bidirectional signaling between Cedar South and uh, Fort Snelling interlockings will increase the resiliency and operational flexibility of the Metro Blue Line. Alstom signaling products, including but not limited to microprocessor control systems and other safety critical signaling control equipment are currently in use on the Metro Blue Line. These products are proprietary to Alstom for the railway industry and are not open architecture. Alstom products are not compatible with other manufacturers. Uh, light rail transit signaling for both new construction and rehab projects, including Green Line Extension and Blue Line Enhancements Phase 2B, also use these same Alstom products. Uh, signal system compatibility is needed to maintain system safety and reliability. Uh, railway system components have continued to experience very long lead times, uh, as high as 12 to 14 months. Uh, that makes it really hard to keep a project schedule, um, and the, hence why I'm here in front of you. Um, so normally these, these would be procured by a contractor. However, like I said, uh, we're trying to get ahead of that because otherwise it's we have to hire a contractor and wait around for one to two years while, <laughs> while parts come in. Um, the Alstom products in this case include, but are not limited to, signal system safety microprocessor control hardware, mainline track circuit equipment, and switch machines. Uh, previously, uh, we've used uh, rail system maintenance, uh, used their existing sole sources to procure uh, this equipment for long lead stuff, but this is a, a really large project. Uh, so we would quickly exhaust their sole sources that they need to maintain our system. <laughs> so uh, that's why, again, that's why we're here. Um, Office of Equity and Equal Opportunity did not review this procurement for subcontracting opportunities because it is executed as a sole source procurement. So, uh, proposing then that the Transportation Committee authorize the, and Metropolitan Council authorize the Regional Administrator to approve a sole source procurement authorization with Alstom signaling for an amount not to exceed $5 million. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments from Council members? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2024-78. So moved. Moved by Councilmember Vento. Is there a second? 
Second. Seconded by Council Member Tyrone Carter. Are there, uh, is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. And back to you, Michael. All right, uh, 2024-79, Blue Line State of Good Repair Phase 3, uh, Siemens Mobility Sole Source. I'll, I'll skip over all the words I just said and, and skip to the, uh, the meat of it. Uh, so this case, Siemens Mobility products, including but not limited to, uh, audio frequency track circuit components and other safety critical signaling control equipment are currently in use on the Metro Blue Line. Um, again, these are not compatible with other manufacturers' parts. Um, and we are currently using these same parts on both on existing projects. Um, in this case, uh, the items that we're looking to procure include grade crossing track circuits, relays, transformers, and other ancillary devices. Um, and again, same, th same deal. We, we previously used the sole sources that our rail system maintenance department has, but again, these are it's a much larger quantity than they would normally procure for maintenance purposes, so we don't want to exhaust those. Um, similarly, again, another sole source procurement, so OEO did not uh, review this procurement. So, proposed action that the Metropolitan Council and Transportation Committee authorize the regional administrator to approve a sole source procurement authorization with Siemens Mobility for an amount not to exceed 2.5 million. Thank you. Questions or comments? Council Member Chambliss. Um, thank you, Chair. I think this is more a question, um, and it's related to the supplies that we have through our uh, regular rail systems maintenance. Yes. Um, that you're saying that um, that's not enough to um, to supply what we need, so we have to go to another um, sole source provider. Am I hearing understanding that correctly, uh, Madam Chair and Committee Member? Uh, that's actually not correct. Okay. Um, this this is executing. <laughs> that's what I'm glad I asked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, this is a this is a, another sole source procurement. So in this case, Rail Systems Maintenance uh, Department they'll get their own sole source for getting the thing the parts they need to maintain it with Siemens Mobility and Alstom Signaling. And then we're going, we in engineering are going to grab our own sole sources here uh, so that we can procure parts for our project, for this, for this project. Gotcha, gotcha. So. thank you for that clarification. Yeah. No problem. Perfect, additional questions or comments? Um, I have one, so um, uh, these are two examples of where there's supply chain issues and long lead lot times. Are there other things that you anticipate we might have to do this on? Because, you know, um, I, I work in you know, operations in different industry, but, um, you know, they're sort of hit or miss. What are the long lead items right now, I think? So just kind of curious what you're finding. Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, yeah, we got at least two more coming. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, one, I think the, 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 the next two will not be sole sources. They'll be uh, competitively procured, but uh, we are expecting one for uh, track work, uh, turnouts and switches, and then we are expecting another one for uh, OCS or overhead uh, context systems, it's the things that hold the wires for the, for the mm -hmm. light rail trains. Uh, we're expecting uh, two more early procurements uh, for those, uh, assuming that they both meet, uh, assuming that they both meet the criteria for bringing it to the transportation committee. Oh, very good. Oh, it seems like a wise move to be ahead. So rather than sit and wait for once we have the, the construction agreements in place. So yep. um, very good. Uh, additional questions or comments? All right. Seeing and hearing none, entertain a motion to approve business item 2024-79. So moved. Moved by Council Member Tony Carter. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Chambliss. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that concludes our business for the evening. Um, if there's no objective or uh, objection, I would say business item number one, which is same week, would go um, non-consent to the full council. And then um, I'd recommend the Haywood office systems upgrade also go non-consent, and the rest can go consent. Everyone agrees? Mm -hmm. Okay. There's my cheat sheet. Um, and then we are on to our information item. We have one information item tonight, and it's a public um, art update. And we have Mark Grenland here to present. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Barber. Um, the remote or for 40 slides? Uh, it should be to the yep. far end of Thank you. I'm uh, Mark Grayland, the Public Art Administrator for Metro Transit, and this is my annual-ish update of uh, what's going on with the Public Art Program. Um, so Metro Transit's Public Art Collection, our Public Art Collection is made up of 80 Public Artworks. 
uh, which are made up of 420 individual pieces. So I always explain that, like uh, Fairview Avenue Station here in St. Paul is considered one artwork, but it actually has eight mosaics at the station. So that's why you see that discrepancy in those numbers there. Um, there's five aspects to our public art and transit program. We have the permanent collection and its maintenance. We have facilities maintenance support. We have community opportunities, new and upgraded facilities, and interpretive programming. So the next three slides are highlights from the year uh, 2023 of conservation treatments and repairs that were done. So in 2023, we applied anti-graffiti coatings to murals at Lake Street Midtown Station, which you see here, and Franklin Avenue Station. As a result, maintenance facility staffs have been removing graffiti with water, mild soap, and very, uh, very much less caustic sort of materials that they were using before. So uh, as opposed to the harsh chemicals they've been using. So it's been a big win in terms of time and of health. And uh, so that's the, the first conservation uh, treatment that I'm talking about. The second one here is we're testing out two techniques for re removing rust from stainless steel at 50th Street Station. Uh, stainless steel, as most people assume, is not supposed to rust, but it does. So uh, especially here uh, along the tracks, you have wheels from the trains going on the, the rails, and so little iron filings go up in the air and land on the stainless steel and start uh, attacking it and creating the rust. So we're trying two different ways of removing the rust and repassivating, which uh, repairing the surface of stainless steel is called repassivation. Um, one method was hand repassivation, working with our conservator KCI. So they're doing it all by hand, seeing how that works. Um, that means applying acid. So um, it's a very unique sort of activity that's done. The other is trying electrolytic repassivation, and that's actually dipping the panels in a vat of acid and running electricity through it. Yeah. Sounds a lot, really fun, doesn't it? Um, so we've uh, done that with three panels. We went out and looked at them this spring, and so this year we're going to do the rest of the panels with the ele electrolytic uh, process because that seemed to be the most successful. So there are 96 panels at the station that we'll be doing. Um, thirdly, uh, talking about graffiti removal, uh, the murals and artwork do reduce the amount of graffiti that happens uh, at our facilities, but still there's about, been about 20 incidents of graffiti a year on the actual artwork. But since we've been putting up the artwork, we're finding that the graffiti that happens is much smaller. It tends to be just a magic marker, somebody who's got a little time and they write their name or do a little doodle instead of the big spray paint kind of graffiti. So um, we still get a little bit of graffiti on the artwork, but it's very manageable, very easy to clean up and take care of. Mm. Uh, another element of our program is uh, doing facilities maintenance. So those projects I already mentioned are helping out facilities a lot, but uh, there's additional things that we're doing. Uh, so the next three si slides will cover that. Uh, we are painting crossing houses at our rail stations. So here's examples. We have on the left and the right side are two crossing uh, houses painted by Taylor Berman. And the one in the middle is painted by Jennifer Davis. And again, these are locations where we've been getting a lot of graffiti. They're just nice little gray houses. They're really nice for tagging. <laughs> Um, so uh, Rail came to me and asked, can we do something about these three in particular? Um, so we put these up and it's been so successful, we're gonna do three more this year. Uh, we're trying out some new things uh, to help with uh, facilities maintenance. One is an anti-graffiti wallpaper. So uh, at Lake Street Midtown Station on the interior, you can see what the walls used to look like. Uh, they used to be off-white and get tagged constantly as people were going up and down the stairs. Uh, but we took the opportunity with the redesign of Lake Street Midtown coming up to try something a little different inside. So we uh, found a printer who will do wallpaper with an anti-graffiti coating on it. Uh, we hired an artist uh, to, uh, who's called Nikki Works, is uh, her artist name, uh, to design a repeating wallpaper and we put it up and it has reduced 
graffiti dramatically, and it's really been just, you wipe it right off the surface. It's been a very, very good program that uh, trying that out, good trial. So, um, so now we're looking at other locations to do this in. Um, the next few slides are our shelter wrap program. So we have a program for beautifying uh, bus shelters throughout the system. We have five more designs ready to go, and we currently have 18 shelters in the system that are wrapped. Uh, the program has been running for two and a half years now. We've been adding artistic wraps to bus shelters, and we've been able to, to actually get hard data from the two and a half years that adding the art clings to the bus shelters reduces incidence of glass breakage by 60% and reduces graffiti by 50%. Uh, this here is an image of Sun and Moon by Alyssa Storms. Nice. And this is uh, at Lindale Avenue and Lake Street. This is artwork by Mandel Cameron. This was done actually with a Ladder of Opportunity grant we had where she engaged the businesses around the bus shelter to come up with uh, the design that she came up with. Hmm. So uh, we're supporting local artists, but also uh, with that grant getting out doing some engagement, community engagement. And finally, this is just one of my favorites, uh, Nina Simone by Jende Barry, oh. Barry mm -hmm. at Franklin and 27th. Just a stunning, <coughs> fun image there. Another element of the program is community opportunities. So we have an opportunity this spring where we're working, working with the Walker Arts Center and Juxtaposition Arts to put the, the same kind of art clings on D-line shelters in North Minneapolis. So uh, again, that's through that Ladder of Opportunity grant that we received. And um, so it's been a really good partnership working with uh, local artists from the neighborhood and the students who go to juxtaposition. And we'll be putting those up in uh, early May and there'll be a big uh, neighborhood celebration on May 18th. Uh, so that's, that's been a really fun partnership so far. We partnered with the City of St. Paul on Smith Avenue ramp as we were closing off a lobby area because bus routing and other things had happened. So uh, we decided to close that off and so that people weren't looking in there and trying to get in and everything we decided to put up some art. We ended up working with the city of St. Paul to select an artist who lives in St. Paul, downtown St. Paul, Dietrich Sealing, and uh, did this nice little art cling project that's there now and uh, making it a better site. When we have new or upgraded facilities, we're looking at adding public art to them. So we have, this last summer, we had I-35W I Lake Street BRT station. Um, I don't know if you've been out there, but it's really beautiful. Um, I suggest you get out there and see it in person. Uh, artist Kata Golan submitted a proposal along with uh, uh, nine, nine other artists. Uh, we had a selection committee, selection panels. Members of the panel were from the neighborhood uh, groups in the area and from the Midtown Greenway. Um, and Kata hired other artists. Um, uh, she hired Stacia Goodman Mosaics to put some special uh, highlights on the bird wings, uh, hired Cara Rodriguez and Laura Estrada. And there was a community paint day. So a lot of engagement, a lot of outreach. And it's been very effective. It's reduced graffiti. I just got some numbers. In the last year since the mural went up, we've had 63 incidences of graffiti at that site. Uh, all but two have been on non-painted surfaces. So um, they are leaving the murals alone. And so now I'm talking to MnDOT about maybe getting those other columns painted that are getting tagged all the time. So we'll see what happens there. Great thing about this too was that uh, this was a first public art contract that had an MCUP uh, percentage uh, goal on it and uh, met it very easily because all the artists were MCUP arts, which is great. So, and here's just a few more, or another picture of that. And then uh, final aspect of the program is interpretation. So uh, all the information about the public art and transit program is on our website. Uh, we list their opportunities for art, artists. We have images of new projects and information about our permanent collection. Uh, the web pages educate the public about our collection. And I get inquiries about once a month from other public art administrators throughout the country about our programs because they've seen our website. Um, 
And one part of the interpretation is public art tours. So uh, we started public art tours before the pandemic, did them one year, and then the pandemic shut them down. <laughs> so we brought them back last year, and we're going to try them again this year, see how they go. But the, they're, they get booked up. Um, and we had a couple internal uh, public art tours last year um, so that other staff from Metro Transit and from procurement could get a better understanding of the public art program. So, and then uh, briefly, I'll just talk about what's going to happen this year beyond what I already talked about. We have some new artwork going in. So this is the southwest corner of the North Loop Garage, the new garage out there at the Haywood campus. And uh, this area where the artwork's going to go is over 5,800 square feet of surface. So a nice big uh, welcome from North Minneapolis as they come across Highway 94 into downtown. And then uh, we're looking at the opposite corner uh, in the northeast corner, which is just over 4,000 square feet of area. Um, so that's going to be a really fun, really large, big splash kind of project. Uh, just other things going on. I'll be presenting with some other Metro Transit staff at the American Planning Association Conference in April about our success in dealing with transit issues through public art. Um, and this year we created an artist roster. So anybody who's interested in opportunities uh, at Metro Transit and also uh, any, any division within the council um, that needs photographers, illustrators, public artists, uh, social engagement artists, writers, anything like that, artists can sign up on to this roster and it's available for anybody who needs to plan any events like that. So I've been working with Amanda Lovely and her group um, on this and helping, helping a little bit with them with their new outreach that they're trying to do for the 2050 plan. Um, so just a little wrap up, just the results of a really vital public art program, which I feel like I've been here seven and a half years and I feel like we are really now finally a vital public mm -hmm. art program that's really getting stuff done where it needs to get done. And that ends up creating a better writer and employee experience, improved condition at facilities and attractive environments. Uh, you end up with easier maintenance, less graffiti and vandalism. You end up with an engaged community through partnerships, supporting local artists, and doing projects that do engagement. And you have a more diverse policy and practice. Uh, we've developed a lot of small project contracts through this program and then MCUB fulfillment. So 60% uh, of all the vendors I work with are either woman, veteran, or person of color owned. And uh, all of the vendors I work with but one are small local businesses. So um, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Um, Council Member uh, Carter, then Ventel. Thank you. Where were you in 2005? <laughs> I really appreciate this report and the acknowledgement that art is not just extra, you know, such as we had been accustomed to hearing in our environment back then. So thankful you're here and that all of us have really adopted the attitude as art, of art as essential seeing what it adds. You know, I don't have a question. I just am overflowing with gratitude, thanking you so much for this report and knowing that the data actually shows what is needed. And thank you so much for being here all these years, Mark. I saw your work, you know, back then, mm -hmm. and I'm thankful that you're in the, this environment now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Pervento. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to echo Councilmember Carter. This is a great report. Um, and I hope that that um, other corners of the council will embrace this. I'm thinking of MCES. They have some facilities and structures that would look great with a little art on them. And I live in a town co home complex in Maplewood, and we have those utility boxes that are ugly, just ugly. I just think it'd be so cool if we, we had art projects. And I'm guessing that there are parents of young kids all over the metro region that want to get a hold of these materials that you use to keep the graffiti. I mean, I, <laughs> bedroom walls, play, you know, playroom walls, kitchen walls, where kids have gotten a hold of mom or dad's markers or pens and have created quite a mess. So kudos, Mark. Thank you very much. And to all the artists. Thank you. 
This is great. You, Councilmember Chambliss. Yeah, um, I, I just am overwhelmed with, with the art. I mean, it, it, it's wonderful. It's varied. Um, I like the local artists um, using the technology uh, and the engineering to figure out how to use soap and water to clean off graffiti. That, that's pretty interesting. I mean, I actually felt like I was going through a gallery presentation. So I, I would encourage you to advertise the website, let people know about this, because I, I think it's, it's wonderful. Thank you. Councilmember Carter. And I'd just like to say I'm happy to meet you, Mark, because I've admired the public art that we've had uh, on Metro Transit. I just didn't know who was behind it. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, you know, it, it, it sends out a great message about spirit, about connection with people of, of all aspects um, that are part of our ridership. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really happy and I'm looking forward to maybe going on one of these public art tours myself. And uh, I just want to give you a high five. Chair Barber and Council Mara, I will share with you when the art tours are scheduled, uh, yeah. so if you're interested. And it, yeah, it's been a good seven and a half years of pulling it together. It really is at a point where, it, I mean, if other divisions are interested, there is a way to, to actually start spreading the love around a little bit, so. That's great. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Uh, I'm just gonna echo all of that, and I really appreciate Tony's comment. Uh, Art is, an, is not just extra. Um, I think that's such a big part of it. And this is one of my favorite presentations every year because I don't think we <laughs> realize what an impact art has on the system until you start calling out these different pieces and to see the data uh, tied with it. And um, you've all heard me ramble on about how I think transit system is its own community. And I think that this piece of it helps it become more of a welcoming community. And so I just really, really appreciate the impact that this is bringing to, to our system and, and making it uh, not just a, a safe place, but a beautiful place for our riders. So much appreciation. So, Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything else, council members, this evening? I didn't want to jinx us that we might get done early, but we are done early, and with that, we can be adjourned. <laughs>